the practice of strategic level spiritual warfare for radical disciples in these very last days. Now, if you'd like to have this presentation as well as the video recordings of all of our past sessions, uh, email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Elijah003 at gmail, that's my email. All right, let's begin. Strategic level spiritual warfare is the practice whereby believers directly address demonic powers, principalities, and territorial spirits in the heavenlies, whereby we directly rebuke them and we command them to leave a specific geographical area in the name of Jesus. And typically, we command them to leave our area in Jesus' name. So this is a somewhat common practice, especially in spirit-filled churches. So therefore, strategic level spiritual warfare is not praying to God. When you pray to God, you are talking to the Lord in heaven. But when you are doing strategic level spiritual warfare, you are talking directly to territorial spirits, to higher level demons in the heavenlies. All right. So what we are talking about here is not prayer to the Lord, but we're talking about warfare directly against territorial spirits, whereby we rebuke them and command them to leave our area in Jesus' name. And this practice is fairly well known within the body of Christ, especially in spirit-filled churches. And the purpose of it is mostly having to do in the realm of missions and evangelism. We have been taught that by doing spiritual warfare in a certain area, uh, that releases the grip of this area from Satan. And so the people there will be more open to receiving Jesus Christ. So that is the primary purpose, I have been told, of strategic level spiritual warfare. Now, there is potential danger in this practice. There is. And because of that, it's important that we understand what scripture teaches about it. What does the Bible say about strategic level spiritual warfare in which we directly address higher level demons in the heavenlies, commanding them to leave our area in Jesus' name? So the question is, is this practice called strategic level spiritual warfare scriptural or not? Is it in the Bible or not? Let's take a look. Now, Dr. C. Peter Wagner was acknowledged as the principal proponent of strategic level spiritual warfare. Dr. Peter Wagner. Let's look at what he wrote in his book called Confronting the Powers on page 152. This is what he wrote. If we are not satisfied with the fruit of our current evangelistic activities, whatever they may be. Strategic level spiritual warfare might at least be worthy of some experimentation. And so the father of this practice, he actually admitted that strategic level spiritual warfare is an experiment, it's experimentation. So he realizes that it's not in the Bible, it's experimentation. So, my reply is, should we experiment with potentially dangerous practices not commanded by the Lord? Should we or should we not? And my answer, of course, is no, we should not. Moreover, we can actually be very satisfied with the fruit of our evangelistic ministry when we are properly trained in the use of the Lord's supernatural authority and power over diseases and demons. And that's what we do in the Elijah Challenge training. We train disciples how to heal the sick and cast out demons exactly as Jesus did, using his supernatural authority and power as evidence to the world, as evidence to those who never heard that Jesus is the only way to the Father, that he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God. That's what we do in the Elijah Challenge. So when we go on a mission trip, we heal the sick, we cast out demons in Jesus' name, people accept Christ. 
and then we begin to disciple them. So we can be very satisfied with the fruit of our ministry when we do what Jesus did as taught in the gospels. And so we can preach the gospel. We can disciple many souls from among gospel resistant peoples when we do exactly what Jesus did. So we're very satisfied simply by doing what Jesus did. And so we don't need to experiment with something potentially dangerous and which is not commanded by the Lord, which is experimental according to the principal proponent of this practice, strategic level spiritual warfare. And his name is Dr. C. Peter Wagner. So there is no need to experiment with things which are not in the Bible. To me, it is highly dangerous. Now, on what should Dr. Wagner's experimentation, quote unquote, be based? On what? Well, look at what he writes. He said, nevertheless, certain people such as shamans, witch doctors, practitioners of Eastern religions, new age gurus, or professors of the occult on university faculties are examples of the kind of people who may have much more extensive knowledge of the spirit world than most Christians have. All right, okay. So we disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should emulate shamans and witch doctors, new age gurus, etc. And experiment with what we might learn from them? Is that what disciples of Jesus Christ should do? And the answer is absolutely no, no, no. But now you understand the origin of strategic level spiritual warfare. It is not from the Bible. It is from secular sources. We do not need to learn anything from shamans, witch doctors, or new age gurus, etc. No, no, no. We have all we need to know from the scriptures, from the Bible. And what do we see in the Bible? Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. He gave them supernatural power and authority. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. This is what we need to know from the scriptures. We have the supernatural power and authority from the Lord to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And we need to learn from the Bible, from the model of Jesus himself, how to use the supernatural authority and power to drive out demons, to perform miraculous healings in order that people will turn to Jesus Christ. This is exactly what is taught in the Elijah Challenge training. And people whom we have trained have gone on to be very, very fruitful. They're very satisfied with what they see on the mission field, what they see in their evangelistic events. So of course, they don't need to experiment with strategic level spiritual warfare. Disciples who are well-trained according to Luke 9 can be very, very fruitful. In scripture, Jesus commands us to love God and to love one another. He commands us to preach the gospel, to heal the sick. He commands us to cast out demons using the Lord's supernatural authority and power. He commands us to make disciples of all nations. And he commands us with regard to other specific matters as well. Now, did Jesus ever command his disciples to drive out principalities and territorial spirits using strategic level spiritual warfare? Did he ever command his disciples to do that? And the answer is no, no, no. Do not go beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. We should not go beyond what is written. When we do, it can be dangerous and have negative consequences. It is presumptuous and risky to attempt to operate in the realm of the supernatural without a specific command from the Lord to do so. Remember, remember Peter's attempt to walk on water 
which was specifically commanded by the Lord for Peter to do. Remember that? Now, Peter would have endangered his life if he had not received a direct command from the Lord before stepping out of the boat. Let's review this, Matthew 14, 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Okay, Peter here is very wise. Before he attempts to step out of the boat onto the water, he asks the Lord for a command. Tell me to come to you on the water. And then Jesus issues a command. Then Peter got down out of the boat only after receiving the command from the Lord. He walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Peter might have drowned after stepping out of the boat if he had not received a direct command from the Lord to come. So, strategic level spiritual warfare is not commanded by Jesus Christ for us to do. No, it is not. Therefore, it is dangerous. Now, teaching on strategic level spiritual warfare is in part based on Daniel chapter 10. And later we will study Ephesians chapter 6. But let's look at Daniel chapter 10 first. Daniel 10 verse 2, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. Mourned for three weeks. Daniel mourned before God. He was praying and fasting before God. It's a priestly action. He was not attacking any principality in the heavenlies. No, he was simply mourning before God, performing a priestly action before God. Verse 3, I ate no choice food. No mine or wine touched, excuse me, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So Daniel was fasting before the Lord. He was not addressing principalities or territorial spirits in the heavenlies. No, no, no. He was just fasting before the Lord. Verse 4, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. And who was that? That was an angel of God. It was not a territorial spirit. It was not a demonic principality. It was an angel sent from God. Verse 8, so I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. And so this glorious angel began to speak to Daniel. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. The angel touched Daniel. This being, this being appearing before Daniel is not a demonic principality or a territorial spirit. No. It is an angel sent by God. Verse 12, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Again, Daniel was praying and fasting before God. This has nothing to do with Strategic level spiritual warfare. He was not attacking any principality. He was simply humbling himself before God. Your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Now this is the principality we are talking about. The prince of the Persian kingdom, a demonic principality who ruled over Persia. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now, who is Michael? Michael is an archangel of God. He's an archangel. So Michael came to help that angel because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Who is this king of Persia? 
The king of Persia is a demonic principality or territorial spirit who rules over Persia. Michael, on the other hand, is a powerful angel of God. So Daniel here is not dealing with a principality, but he is talking to an angel of God. That is not warfare. That is not warfare. Verse 20, so he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. So who is the one who does the fighting against this principality, this prince of Persia? Who? It is this angel. And I believe this angel is Gabriel. This angel will return to fight against this principality. So Daniel is not fighting against this principality, but God's angel will be fighting against this prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Now, who is this prince of Greece? The prince of Greece is another principality which rules over the nation of Greece. Okay, that is a principality. The prince of Greece is a principality. The prince of Persia is a principality. Now, who is the one who will fight against the prince of Persia? Is it Daniel? No, no, no. It is this angel whom I believe is Gabriel. He will be the one to fight against these principalities, the prince of Persia. Certainly, it was not Daniel who was to fight against the prince of Persia. No, no, no. Here in Daniel 10, the prophet Daniel was simply fasting before the Lord he was not attacking or conducting spiritual warfare against the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece. No, no, no. And God sends a glorious angel, I believe Gabriel, to Daniel in response to his praying and fasting. His praying and fasting, of course, they are priestly actions directed against God. So Daniel was not performing any kingly actions to attack the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece. No, but he was performing a priestly action before God, praying and fasting unto the Lord. The angel is the one who does the fighting. The angel is the one who does the fighting, not Daniel. Scripture does not record any disciple performing spiritual warfare against principalities, whether in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. Now, what might be the consequences of performing direct spiritual warfare against territorial spirits and principalities in presumption? without specifically being commanded by the Lord to do so. Let me just repeat something before I go on. Strategic, strategic level spiritual warfare is not prayer. It is not prayer. Prayer is unto God. Strategic level spiritual warfare is against territorial spirits and principalities. They are very, very different. So I am not talking about prayer. I'm talking about direct warfare against high-level demonic beings. Okay, what is the consequence of doing this in presumption without being commanded by the Lord to do so? Look what happened to the Israelites in the Old Testament when they attacked their enemies in presumption. Numbers 14, 44. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they, meaning the Israelites, they went up toward the high hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites, that is their enemies who lived in that whole country, came down and attacked them. The Israelites were attacked by their enemies. You see, the Israelites, their intention was to attack their enemies, the Amalekites and the Canaanites. But what happened because of their presumption was that Everything was reversed. Their enemies, the Amalekites and the Canaanites, they came down and attacked the Israelites instead and beat them all the way down to Horma. So the Israelites were defeated. The consequence of their presumptive action was resounding defeat at the hands of their enemies. 
the Lord did not command the Israelites to attack their enemies. Not here, not yet. They did so in presumption only. And the consequence was a resounding defeat at the hand of their enemies, an embarrassing and painful defeat. In the same way, unwitting and uninformed believers can be attacked by territorial spirits in retaliation for unauthorized spiritual warfare against them. When you perform unauthorized spiritual warfare, meaning God did not command you to do it, God did not authorize you to do it, you did it in presumption, when you do it, you can be attacked by the territorial spirit whom you were attacking in presumption. When they attack us in retaliation for what we have done, the Lord is not obligated to protect us. No. Why? Since because we have disobeyed and gone, gone beyond God's word. We have done something in presumption over and beyond his command, beyond his word. And so when we are attacked, the Lord is not obligated to protect us. It's our own fault. So what type of warfare are we commanded and given the authority to do? We are not commanded to do strategic level spiritual warfare as taught by Dr. C. Peter Wagner. So what kind of warfare are we commanded and given the authority to do? Well, it is clear. Matthew 10, verse 1. And when Jesus had called to him his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So we are given supernatural authority and commanded to heal the sick and cast out demons. Now, where are these diseases found? Well, of course, in people. And where are people found? On earth, at ground level. How about unclean spirits? Where do we find unclean spirits whom we can cast out? We find them in people who are demonized. And so these unclean spirits, which we are authorized to cast out, are found at ground level. We cast them out of people who are at ground level. And so all of this commandments that we are commanded, all of these things that we are commanded to do by the Lord are at ground level and not in the second heaven, not in the heavenlies. It's all at ground level. Preach the gospel to people where at ground level. Heal the sick. Heal sick people where at ground level. Cast demons out of people. Where are these people? At ground level, not in the second heaven. Matthew 10, verse 7. And as you go, proclaim, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. These are all ground level activities on earth. And not in the second heaven. Not in the heavenlies. So the commands that Jesus gives us are all for ground level activity. Ground level warfare, if you want to call it that. Luke 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Verse 10. He commands them, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And then skipping to verse 17, Luke 10, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Meaning when they commanded demons to come out of people, the demons submitted and came out and the people were set free. This is ground level. The 72 disciples were also commanded and authorized to heal the sick and cast out demons from people. People where at ground level? Where are the sick to be found? At ground level on earth. Where did they find the demons to be cast out? They found the demons in people who live at ground level. All of these are found at ground level. On the ground. Then 
in the very next verse, look what Jesus says. Verse 18, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven only after the disciples obeyed his command in Luke 10, verse 9. Only after they went forth to heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Only after the disciples obeyed his command in Luke 10, verse 9, did Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The disciples did not have to command Satan to come down from heaven. No, they did not. All they did was mind their own business. All they did was obey the Lord's command at ground level. They were healing the sick at ground level, proclaiming the kingdom of God at ground level. And as they did so, Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The disciples did not have to directly address Satan and command him to come down from heaven. No, when they did what they were commanded to do, what happened? Satan fell like lightning from heaven. Our business is at ground level. While we obey the Lord's ground level commands and we mind our own business at ground level, God takes care of Satan in the heavenly realms above. Yes, yes, yes. Our authority and our business is at ground level. God will take care of business in the heavenlies as we pray. Yes, if you want to pray to God about powers and principalities, if you have a burden with regard to them, yes, you can pray to God. And God can send angels just like he did in the case of Daniel chapter 10. Okay, prayer is fine. But we do not directly address Satan or powers and principalities and commanding them to come down or to leave. No, no, no. That is not biblical. Luke 10, verse 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now. This promise, nothing will harm you, is wonderful. Of course, we want to see that promise fulfilled in our lives, especially when we are doing ministry. We want nothing to harm us. So, But what is the context of this promise from Jesus that nothing will harm us? What is the context? The context is healing the sick, casting out demons, proclaiming the kingdom of God at ground level. That is the context. And when we go beyond the Lord's command and we start rebuking territorial spirits, then the promise is no longer valid. Sometimes something will harm us because we have disobeyed God's command. We have done something he did not command us to do. That is disobedience and it has consequences. Now, where do we find snakes and scorpions? over which we have authority, we can trample on them. Where do we find them? Only on the ground. They cannot fly. They do not represent territorial spirits in the heavenlies. They represent demons at ground level, demons which attack and possess and control people. Actual snakes and scorpions, they crawl on the ground. Therefore, they refer to unclean spirits whose activity is at ground level, afflicting people. Snakes and scorpions do not refer to territorial spirits and principalities in the heavenlies. No, no, no. Scripture does not explicitly teach that we have been given authority to drive out such territorial spirits and principalities in the heavenlies. No, no. No, no. The wonderful promise that nothing will harm you applies only if we remain at ground level in our actions where we have authority over snakes and scorpions. The promise no longer holds if we attempt to use our authority in the heavenlies against principalities. Okay. Now, there's much more to come, much more to come. 
Ah, Ephesians 6. This is the claimed basis for spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Okay. With the full armor of God on us, we can take our stand. Now, armor, of course, is not for offensive purposes or attacking the enemy. No, armor is for a defensive purpose. Take your stand above is a defensive posture. Paul did not say attack the devil. No, he said take your stand it's a defensive posture. You're not attacking. You're taking your stand. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, Paul here is talking about territorial spirits, powers, principalities, and the like. Where do you find them? In the heavenly realms. These four are often referred to as territorial spirits. They are generals in Satan's army, high-level demonic beings. I call them generals in Satan's army. They're not on earth. They're in the heavenlies. They dwell not on earth, but in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Armor, again, is not for offensive purposes, but rather for defensive ones. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take, excuse me, to stand your ground. A second time, Paul says, stand, stand, stand your ground. Not attack, but stand your ground. And after you have done everything to Stand, not to attack, but to stand, to hold your position. Stand. Armor, again, is for standing our ground, not for advancing and attacking the enemy. It's for standing our ground. Verse 14. Stand firm, then. The fourth time, Paul says, stand firm, then, not attack but stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the resiness, readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Four times we are told to stand. Four times. Not just once, twice, three times, but four times we are told to stand. It could not be more clear. And not to attack. We are not to attack territorial spirits. We are not to rebuke them. We are not to command them to leave. No. But we are told to stand if and when we are attacked. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Shield of faith. A shield is for defense, not offense, generally with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's for self-defense, not for attacking. A shield is for extinguishing the flaming arrows of the devil. Self-defense. Extinguishing arrows is a defensive action. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation to protect your head. Protect your head. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, swords can also deflect the enemy's thrusts, okay? Of course, I know a sword can be used for offense, but it can also be used for defense. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And what does the Word of God command us to do? John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. Nowhere does the Lord command us to engage the rulers, the authorities, 
the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms in direct combat. We are not commanded to engage these four types of demonic beings in direct combat. There's no such command. And so let us keep the commands of the Lord. Rather, our combat is at ground level as foot soldiers. We are boots on the ground. We are foot soldiers. So we are to stand firm against demonic powers and principalities with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the word of God. That's how we stand firm, not attack, but stand firm against powers and principalities. Therefore, these verses clearly speak of a defensive posture, standing firm against the devil's schemes and against powers and principalities. And do not refer to the offensive action taught by spiritual warfare advocates, meaning strategic level spiritual warfare. We are not to attack territorial spirits. Now, what about Ephesians 1? Verse 20 and 21. Well, let's have a look. Ephesians 1.19, we'll start with that. His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So right now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. So now Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, far above these four kinds of demonic territorial spirits, far, far above them. And every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, Ephesians 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, meaning we also, as being seated with Christ, we are far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Correct? Yes. Positionally, we are seated with Christ far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Yes, positionally. Positionally, yes, we are on the winning side. The Bible tells us who's going to win in the end. We are on the winning side, yes, positionally. But in actual war, do the foot soldiers of one army directly attack the generals of the enemy army? Is that what happens in actual warfare? No, no, no. Foot soldiers of one army only engage in the foot soldiers of the enemy army. Foot soldiers, boots on the ground, ground level. We preach the gospel. We heal the sick. We cast out demons. All at ground level. We engage the enemy at ground level. We do not directly attack the generals. We do not attack Satan's generals. We do not directly attack powers, principalities, authorities, and so forth. No, we engage the foot soldiers of the enemy. Cast out demons from people who are demonized. Therefore, our mission and our activity as foot soldiers are boots on the ground. We preach the gospel to people on earth. We heal the sick on earth. We cast out demons from people on earth. Our business is on earth. The domain given to us by God at this time is on earth, not in the heavenlies, no. The heavenlies are the domain of the heavenly host. Let us mind our own business. Now, let me give you an illustration from the realm of earthly government. Let's say you live in a country where you hold elections uh, in order to elect a president or a prime minister, okay? So let's say that in your country, 
uh, the one who was legally elected by the majority of the people is a president or a prime minister whose policies you don't like. Okay. Maybe he's against Christians. Maybe he's against conservative values. You don't like him. All right. And you want him to go. So do you have the authority as a disciple of Jesus Christ to rebuke him and to command him to leave his office? Do you have that legal authority? And of course, no, of course you do not. Because that man or that woman was legally elected as the leader of your country. You can't get rid of him just by commanding him to go in Jesus' name. No. So how do you get rid of him? Well, you can pray. Yes, obviously, you pray to God. You say, Lord, uh, during the next election, please give us a godly leader, Lord. Okay. And what else do you do? Well, you can go to your friends, your neighbors, your, your relatives, and you can tell them, hey, the election is coming up uh, next year. Be sure to vote for the other guy, the one who is conservative, the one who, who is a Christian. Vote for him. All right. The next election, vote for him. That's the democratic process. And for us believers, what does that mean? That means we are preaching the gospel. If you are in a country which is really dark and ruled by some principality, what do you do? Yeah, you can pray. You can pray and fast like Daniel. And you can also what? Preach the gospel to as many people as you can. Because eventually, if you bring many, many people to Jesus Christ in your country, eventually that principality which rules over your country he's going to have to leave automatically why because the people are no longer worshiping him now they're worshiping god so he loses his job he leaves all right so it's through prayer to god and through the preaching of the gospel that we can rid our country of these powers and principalities okay that's the bible way we pray we preach the gospel. We heal the sick. We cast out demons. We bring many people to Jesus Christ. We fulfill the great commission. And then the end will come. And then Jesus Christ returns the kingdom of God on earth. Now, but there is an argument that spiritual warfare can bear fruit, can produce good fruit for the gospel. Uh, I have heard of cases in which a team of people, they go into an area and they do spiritual warfare for several days. Okay, they rebuke the territorial spirit controlling that area. And then after that, the gospel is preached and many people turn to the Lord. Okay, and they think it is because of the spiritual warfare, which was done in advance. Okay, well, let's address this issue. It is argued that the practice of spiritual warfare, while not supported by scripture, of course, but it results in fruit during subsequent evangelism. However, obeying Jesus' commands to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God from house to house also bears fruit. So there are two different approaches, all right? Both of them can be fruitful. But one approach directly follows the commands of Christ, while the other does not. With one approach, nothing will harm you. With the biblical approach to proclaiming the kingdom of God, nothing will harm you. But with the other approach, an angered enemy can, in fact, retaliate against you, as we will see in a moment. It is clear which approach is to be preferred. You see, when you do strategic level spiritual warfare, you are not obeying God's command. You rebuke a territorial spirit. He doesn't like it. And he may decide to retaliate against you and go after you and attack you. And God is not obligated to protect you because you have sinned. You went beyond God's command. Let's do a cost benefit analysis of strategic level spiritual warfare. Uh, if you have this presentation, click on that link, and it will take you to an article on our website. Strategic level spiritual warfare is an unnecessary practice which wastes time and effort. It's not necessary. It can result in retaliation from the enemy in terms of painful and unnecessary personal trials. Personal trials. Trials for you and your family for your health, for your ministry. 
and even going home before God's time. Yes. Okay. So that is the cost of spiritual warfare. That is the cost. There, is, there may be some benefit. Some people do get saved, but there's a heavy cost involved. Are you willing to pay this cost? So let's instead stick to the Lord's command in Luke 9, verse 1. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Go. House to house. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Proclaim the kingdom of God. Let me share with you a report. I have been to Brazil several times in the past several years. Let me share this. Over the years, we have ministered many times in Brazil, often for a certain ministry there, which has been very fruitful for missions in Brazil. This ministry always received us in the Elijah Challenge training with open arms and hearts. On my visits to train them, however, I noticed that when they gather together to pray and worship the Lord, they often address and rebuke territorial spirits as well. Occasionally, I would speak out against this practice, but within the leadership, it generally fell on deaf ears. Then last year, I think it was actually now two years ago, I received news about them. While a team from this ministry was on their way by bus to share the gospel in a city in the Northeast bound by powerful witchcraft, an unimaginable accident took place. Some team members were killed in the bus when it overturned on the road. Included among those killed was a very fruitful servant of God whom we had trained years earlier and whom the Lord then used in extraordinary ways to heal the sick miraculously when the gospel was preached. His name was Brother Roberto, if I recall correctly. Very, very sad. Why did this happen? Why did God allow it to happen? Was it God's perfect will? No, I don't think so. If not, why did it happen? Okay, that's an open question, all right? Now, let me share with you another testimony, an overwhelming experience with strategic level spiritual warfare that shook up a servant of God whom, whom we trained. His name was Mark. Mark. This is what Mark sent me. He said, I was ministering deliverance to a very oppressed lady by Skype and somewhat in frustration, I commanded the superiors of the chief demon oppressing the lady to not give any more assignments against her. He spoke to the superiors of the chief demon, oppressing the lady. In other words, I was addressing spirits of higher rank outside of the lady. Outside of those demons inhabiting her from which she personally needed to get free. All of a sudden, the air got incredibly thick. I felt an increasing weight on my chest and a sense of great danger and foreboding. It quickly became overwhelming. I had to mute the screen while I took a moment to cancel my words just spoken and plead the protection of the blood of Jesus. I did this several times over the next minute or so until I felt the evil and dread receding. I remained shaken up for several minutes afterwards. Wow, what a lesson. As you can see, my actions and words were akin to what they call strategic level spiritual warfare. Of course, you in the Elijah Challenge, you have warned the body of Christ against this. Speaking theologically, it is not that we are not in a position superior to these higher spirits and even over Satan himself. Because when we resist the devil, he will flee from us. So positionally, we are in a place superior to those higher spirits. Because we are in Christ, we are seated in Christ at the right hand of God, 
far above all power, rule, authority, and so forth. We have power and authority over them based on our position seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father. The problem is this. We have not been given orders from our commanding officer to use our power and authority to engage these higher spirits at this time. Therefore, we are operating rogue when we do this. And we have no cover from their forces, therefore. And that is serious danger. Jesus dealt with personal deliverance, period. That is why we should use prayers in front of an abortion clinic or other dark places and over cities, but not commands. Prayer is fine, but you do not command those unclean spirits over abortion clinics and other dark places. No. Or at least we do not give commands to territorial spirits whereby we engage them directly. No, no, no. I received this a couple of years ago from a servant of God whom we trained. His name was Mark. Let me share with you an experience. Several years ago, when we were pastoring a church, we had a very dear sister named Cherie. She was very zealous. One day, she was driving down the street, and it was a street in Chinatown, and uh, there was a Buddhist temple on that street. And as she drove past this Buddhist temple, she rebuked the Buddhist spirit inside that temple, and then she drove home. Well, you know what happened? The spirit inside that Buddhist temple was offended, was angered, and that spirit followed Cherie all the way home to her apartment. And in her apartment, that spirit attacked her over a period of one week. Finally, she came to us. We told her to repent of what she had done. She repented, and the attack ceased. Now, even though the spirit in that Buddhist temple might not be a territorial spirit. I'm not sure if it is or not. But the point is, the spirit has the legal right to be in that Buddhist temple because the Buddhists who worship their God, who worship their religion legally in that temple, the Buddhists invited that spirit to come. And so that spirit was there legally. And so... When Cherie rebuked it and commanded it to get out of the temple, she went beyond God's word. She did something beyond her authority. She did something which was essentially illegal. Illegal. Because that spirit was in that temple legally. All right? Now, what about haunted houses? Okay. Now, haunted houses are haunted because they have demons inhabiting them. Now, if the owner of the house wants that house to be cleansed and the owner of the house asks you to go and drive the demons out, then fine, you can do that. You can do that safely, all right? But if the owner of the house wants the demons there, then you have no right to drive out those demons. If you try, you may find yourself in hot water, okay? So in such matters, we have to go by the law. Yes, we have to go by the law. If the demons are there legally, you cannot drive them out. Okay? The law is very important. All right? Okay. Now, let me share with you something. Something that I did several years ago in the African nation of Uganda, defeating witchcraft, the birthplace of witch, witchcraft. Witchcraft originates from Africa, in particular from the nation of Benin, okay? If you have witchcraft in your country, let me tell you, it was born in Africa. So witchcraft in Africa is the darkest, is the most powerful. I was in Uganda in a town called Arua in 2005. Wow, 17 years ago. 
<clears throat> First, a group of local disciples was trained with the Elijah challenge over a period of two to three days. Okay, that was the first thing I did. I trained local disciples how to heal the sick and cast out demons as Jesus did. We trained them with the Elijah challenge. After that, we put into practice what we had taught them. Let me share you what we did. With the help of a local pastor, we arranged for an evangelistic healing outreach in the marketplace of a town called Arua. So we, we drove there. We brought with us two sound speakers. You see them on the left and the right. And after that, we had our worship team minister in song. They began to sing, all right? We didn't hand out any flyers. There was no announcement. We just went to the marketplace, set up our speakers, and had the worship team start singing. And there happened to be people, bystanders, there at the marketplace, and they were drawn to the sound of the music. Okay, when they heard the sound of the music, they looked in our direction. And people were drawn to us by the singing. They began trickling in slowly. And finally, after a few minutes, a small crowd gathers around us. All right. Now, I step forward, and I'm going to proclaim the kingdom of God. But what do I do first? I say, anyone here who needs physical healing, and you want to be healed by God, raise your hand. That's how I started with the gospel. Because Jesus said, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. So I started out with asking who needs healing. Okay? And many people raised their hands to indicate that they wanted God to heal them. Okay, many, many hands are raised. And then I send our newly trained team members to go, lay hands on them, heal them using authority in the name of Jesus. Go, 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 do it now. So our team members, they go and heal the sick and cast out demons with the supernatural power and authority given them by the Lord in Luke 9 and Luke 10. All right, there you see them ministering to the sick laying on of hands, issuing commands. Here you see team members laying hands on the sick and commanding healing in Jesus' name. They exercise their authority over disease and demons by rebuking and commanding them to go in Jesus' name. Okay, we can do this safely. We can do this safely. This is all ground level. People are miraculously healed and they come forward to testify publicly, okay? After a few minutes, I say, okay, who is healed? People raise their hands and they say, come to me. And people start coming to me to testify about their miracle. Okay? Many are healed and they line up to testify one by one by one by one by one. This woman testifies of her healing. Uh, at my left is, at my right rather, is my interpreter. Many wait their turn to testify of what the Lord has done for them. You see the whole crowd of ladies there? Mostly ladies, huh? God healed them, and now they are waiting to testify. More and more testimonies of miraculous healings. One after another, after another, after another. Now the onlookers, they're amazed. They listen to the testimony. They say, hey, what's going on here? These miracles are taking place. We've never seen this before. All these people are testifying about miracles. On and on, they testify of the power of the name of Jesus to heal and deliver. This one spectator, she ponders. She begins to ponder the meaning of the miracles. What's going on here? Wow, this is crazy. What's going on? This woman, before she could not read print, now she's able to read from the Bible out loud. This boy had some kind of problem in his stomach. And as they laid hands on him, he could feel the power of God at work in his deceased stomach. If I'm not mistaken, I think he had a tumor or something. And then I say, okay, who wants to believe in Jesus? Then I preach the gospel very quickly. And I say, who wants to accept Jesus? Who wants to repent of their witchcraft and accept Jesus? Between 60 and 75 people raise their hands to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. After seeing the miracles and hearing the gospel of the kingdom of God, they saw that witchcraft cannot compare with the power of the name of Jesus Christ. 
the people then, they pray to the Lord, asking the Lord to forgive their sins. And they put their faith in Jesus Christ. They renounce witchcraft and traditional spiritual practices. I'm leading them in prayer here. Children enter the kingdom of God as they accept Christ into their hearts. Afterwards, even more testimonies of healing. The man you see there, he is the local pastor who helped to organize this meeting for us. His name is Pastor Jimmy Kato, originally from Sudan. At the end, we worship the Lord and rejoice in what he has done. The following Sunday, new believers show up at Pastor Jimmy's church. This is what he sent me the following year. The Lord has done many things through the teaching you gave us in Arua. About four new churches were opened outside of Arua by different church leaders who were in your training for new churches. Many miracles happened and are still happening as a result of the Elijah challenge. The church I pastor has grown twice, doubled or more since you left. We have evening services every day and all night meetings twice a week. I was the only pastor before, but now we have four pastors. So that was what happened in Arua 17 years ago on my mission trip to Africa. Now I issue a challenge for those of you in Asia, especially for those of you in Asia. What was done in Uganda can also be done very fruitfully in East Malaysia, referring, of course, to Sarawak and Sabah. For example, you can do this in a longhouse, in an orang, orang asli longhouse, Aboriginal longhouse, or in a village marketplace like we did. If you want, if you don't want to have the music, you can serve a meal. That will also draw people to you, okay? Or maybe both, music and food. Whatever will draw the people to you. Do whatever will draw people to you. And when the people are there, then what do you do? You heal the sick who are there. And after they're healed, you tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So heal the sick and preach the gospel to the Aboriginal people in Sarawak and Sabah during these very last days. That is my challenge to disciples in Asia. You can do it. If I did it, you can do it. I am no one special. I do not have the gift of healing, but I simply obey the gospel, obey the word of God. So you will go, you will do this in Sarawak and Sabah during these very last days. And then you will make disciples of those who accept Jesus Christ. And you do this before the Muslims reach them using financial incentives. In East Malaysia, it is well known that the Muslims are there trying to bribe the people to convert to Islam using financial incentives. Disciples of Jesus Christ must do this before the Muslims reach them. And now you are well trained. If you are trained with the Elijah challenge, you can do this. You just have to step out of the boat like Peter. Jesus already tells you, come, come, come to Sabah, come to Sarawak. So you step out of the boat, you will not sink because you have already trained. You have no more doubt. You have mountain moving faith. You have faith of God. If you have trained with the Elijah challenge, you can do this very fruitfully. Now, who is willing to lead and organize this? Who among you? listening to me, especially in Asia, is willing to lead and organize this. May the Lord quicken your heart. Now, let me share with you an announcement. Season two for Radical Disciples will begin next month. Right now, we are still in season one. We are in the very last few weeks of season one. Season two will begin next month. This is especially for newcomers and those who were not with us for all of season one. If you weren't with us for all of season one, then join us for season two. Some topics I will recover in season two will be the following. I will cover topics already covered in season one, but I will enhance them 
for season two. They will be advanced. They will be more clear, more effective. Here are some topics which I will cover. Our early missionary adventures in Indonesia from 1987, excuse me, 1978 to 1987. We left the American dream. I left America. I took my wife, Lucille. We ended up in West Borneo, West Kalimantan. And when I arrived, I had no support from any church. I was not sent by any mission agency. I had no idea what I was going to do. After arriving in West Borneo, I went totally by faith, but God was faithful. I'm going to share our early missionary adventures in Indonesia. I will share about eternal reward for fruitful disciples in heaven. Not salvation, but eternal reward, which is above and beyond salvation, which is based on how much fruit you reap for the Lord and the kind of fruit you reap for the Lord. I will teach on what Jesus meant when he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I will teach on startling revelations from the parables of Jesus. Revelations that I think you have never heard, but which are there. I will teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1977, very powerfully, just like on the day of Pentecost. After that, my life was totally changed. Before that, I was just pursuing the American dream. After I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I gave up the American dream. I left everything, left my PhD, left everything. I ended up in West Borneo, preaching the gospel in unreached primitive regions. I have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I will share on that. I will teach about radical grace for radical disciples. I will, teaching a, I will be teaching about a grace of which you have never heard. And this is the kind of grace that God has in store for radical disciples. I will share on the shocking messages of Jesus in the book of Revelation, especially to the church, to the seven churches. I will teach on the very last day's church, which I believe is the church of Laodicea. I will teach on the practices of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates, as found in Revelation 2 and 3. I will teach about the false Christs and false prophets in Matthew 24. I will teach on the meaning of the anointing according to the Bible. What exactly is the anointing according to scripture? I will teach again about strategic level spiritual warfare. I will teach about food and diet for radical disciples with other new topics to be added. Like season one, we will meet every Saturday at 10 p.m. Malaysia Singapore time which will be 9 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. Central Standard Time in the USA. Uh, let me just share this with those of you who are outside of Asia, especially those of you who are in the USA. In season two, we'll, we will be in daylight savings time, which will mean we will gain an hour of sleep. So instead of meeting at 8 a.m. every Saturday, we will be meeting at 9 a.m. every Saturday Central standard time in the USA. So please remember that those of you in the US or those of you where daylight savings time is observed. The Zoom link will be exactly the same as we are using right now for season one, exactly the same link, no change with the link. So no change as far as the date is concerned, every Saturday. No registration is required. Just come to be equipped to bear much good fruit for our soon coming King, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Okay. Hey, I noticed some, some of you are leaving. Don't leave yet. I have something to share about our missionary adventures in Kalimantan. You don't want to miss that. So please stay. Please don't leave just yet. I have something that you want to hear. John 5, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Here, Jesus is talking to his disciples. So, I hope to see some of you on Saturday, April 16, for our very first class of season two. Next month, April 16th, Saturday, I hope to see some of you then. Now, 
let me continue sharing on our missionary adventures in West Borneo from 1978 to 1987. And uh, the narration will be taken from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, our book. If you'd like to have this book, email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com and I'll send you the file of the book. All right. Now, by 1984, 1985, our meeting location in Batu Ampad, West Kalimantan, was full. Okay, it was full. So let me share with you what happened. Okay. It was in early 1985 that the movie theater, the local movie theater, was put up for sale. Uh, the location of the theater was perfect, right in the middle of town of Batu Ampad. Our meeting place, as you can see, was no longer met the needs of our growing congregation. And besides, our next door neighbors who were Muslims had already made it quite clear with a petition to the local authorities that their patience with our stirring, praise-filled services every Sunday morning was running out. Now, the authorities had already, the government, had already offered us a plot of swampland but it was desolate. It was really terrible, on which we could build our new church. But after seeing the site, it, we decided on a plan of inaction until something better should come up. It was actually in a swamp, okay? Finally, the owner of the two local movie theaters in town decided to put one of them up for sale. And so, there's the movie theater, okay? Now, for a year, the theater attracted scant attention from any buyer, including us. We had been seeking alternative sites for our church, but we never considered the theater. But little by little, our attention was directed to the possibility of buying the theater. Now, this movie theater was a far cry from your typically plush Western movie theater, Instead, it bore some resemblance to a cement floored warehouse lined with row upon row of wooden seats. That's all it was. But for us, it was perfect, seating nearly a thousand people when filled to capacity. Its downtown location would be so convenient for our people and for curious visitors. Despite our previous experience with the townspeople who were so firmly against having a church anywhere in their midst downtown. Despite that, we wanted to purchase the movie theater and then convert it into our church. We had prayed much to the Lord about the theater, and we were convinced that it was his will for us to possess it. And so we made our intentions known to the community. Their reaction was swift and certain. Rumors began to fly around town suggesting that if we dared to follow up on our intentions, our house would be set on fire. We also heard that the local military and civilian authorities, fearing a violent reaction from the community, were opposed to our move. One morning, we awoke to find a dead dog hanging by its neck from our front gate, a cruel illustration of what might happen to me. Yet, once I committed myself to the owner of the theater to buy it, I could not look back whatever the consequences might be. As the months passed and we applied to the regional government for a permit to use the theater for our church meetings, the anxiety and pressure upon us mounted along with the explosiveness of the situation in Batu Ampad. Various leaders from all over town worked together with the Chinese idol worshipers to force us to build on the desolate swamp land, which had already been given to us earlier. The incessant tension upon us drove us to seek God continually. One day in the early spring of 1985, we received an official document from the office of the state government official who was overseeing our region, and he was requesting our presence at a town meeting where the potentially explosive problem of the movie theater would be discussed and decided upon. The governor of the state of West Borneo, the governor of West Kalimantan, 
had assigned to this official the responsibility of leading the meeting. All the local officials under him, as well as local military and police officials, would be present at this town meeting. All of the lay leaders, the prominent citizens, and religious leaders of Batu Ampad, nearly 30 in all, were requested to attend. Moreover, we and our leaders of the church in Batu Ampad were told to show up. The meeting was to be held on April 5th, 1985. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, that day, April 5th, 1985, was Good Friday, the traditional anniversary of the death of our Lord Jesus, who suffered on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years earlier, to give birth to the church of the living God on earth. Earlier that evening, before the meeting, several of the brethren gathered in Brother Abak's house to pray concerning the town meeting. The meeting was to occupy the first floor of a local restaurant. By around seven o'clock in the evening, the state government official sent by the governor of the state was ready to call the meeting to order in that restaurant. Lucille, my wife, along with three of our leaders, including Brother Abak and Brother Elias, and I were seated not far from the government official, feeling greatly outnumbered by the hostile crowd surrounding us. This official was a small-framed, dark man, and he began the meeting with some preliminary remarks concerning the purpose of the gathering, and then he proceeded to address me in front of the people. He said to me, Sir, we appreciate your efforts in coming from so far away to our country to teach us about Christianity. You are here at great personal sacrifice and at the expense of much time and effort. However, your presence in this community has brought problems. You are a guest in our country and a guest should learn to live according to the rules of the host country. But you, sir, have been a misbehaving and troublemaking guest. You have caused tension between religions in this community and unrest for some local citizens here. Eyes turned to glare at me as heads nodded silently at the government official's words to me. He had chosen not to consider the very real possibility that the tension was caused not by us, but rather by certain religious leaders intensely resentful of us because of God's blessings upon our labors. The official said to me, Sir, you have the right to teach your religion to your followers. But as far as purchasing the movie theater for use as your church building, that is a difficult proposition. The community is not willing to allow you to do that. Turning to the community representatives around the room, he asked them, what do you think about the followers of Jesus Christ turning the movie theater into a church? An avalanche of voices from around the room spilled forth. Not possible! The townspeople, encouraged and emboldened by the state government's officials' position, gave themselves over to a lynch mob spirit. They began to jeer and to laugh at us for our idea of wanting the theater. The government official turned back to us, a shadow of a grin creasing his dark face. And he said, you see, we cannot give you permission to use that theater as a church. But sir, what about our constitution? I suddenly heard a female voice speak up in a very measured and deliberate tone. I turned to my side and I heard my wife Lucille challenge the government official. No one has said anything in our defense or raised any objections to the one-sided proceedings arranged by the government official. I had been too intimidated to even open my mouth. Brother Abak and Brother Elias cowered silently next to me. No one has said anything on our behalf until my feisty wife, Lucille, filled with the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit, referred to the rights accorded to us by the Constitution of Indonesia, the Pancasila, which forms the basis for all law in Indonesia. 
that grants the right for Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Christianity to coexist in Indonesia. Lucille continued to speak to him, her tone soft, but not intimidated. I had never heard her speak with such authority before. She said, Mr. Government Official, Papupati, the Constitution of Indonesia grants us as followers of Jesus Christ the right to worship our God here in Batu Ampar. And he replied, the Constitution does not apply here. I could hardly believe what I had just heard from a government official whose sworn, was, whose sworn responsibility was to uphold the Constitution, a document honored in Indonesia in nearly reverent terms. A lower ranking official who was taping the entire meeting on a recorder, he shifted nervously in his seat. When he heard the Bupati, the state official say, the government does, the constitution does not apply here in this village. And then the government official continued, hey, this is not Jakarta, the capital. This is a remote region where people are simply uneducated and cannot be expected to follow the constitution. Apparently, the government official was intent on offending everyone at the meeting. But the townspeople seemed not to mind as long as they had their way with the troublesome followers of Jesus Christ. And then he said to me, sir, we cannot guarantee the safety of your church in that location, in the movie theater. Therefore, your request for a permit to use the theater as your church building is denied. However, we would like you to consider building your church on a site that the government can give you for free. There is a plot of land outside of town near the sawmill next to the graveyard where the Chinese bury their dead. We will give you that land to build your church. The site the government official was so willing to donate to us was off the dirt path which connected Batu Ampad with the sawmill where Lan Yi and her family lived, a distance of about three and a half kilometers. A certain desolate stretch of this path penetrated into a densely foliated no man's land where the only inhabitants were the spirits of the dead, or so it was thought by the local people. This was because of the solitary presence of the Chinese graveyard. At night, this lonely stretch was totally unlit, the only visible things being the ghosts, the disembodied spirits, or whatever dreaded being that a terrified imagination can conjure up as one hurriedly walked or biked through that dark area. Equally frightening was the prospect of meeting with a mugger or a rapist or some large animal that the jungle on either side of the path might spit out onto the path as someone passed by. Who would possibly want to go to, say, an evening church meeting in that God-forsaken area. Now, during the day, the situation would be better, but not by much. Two, excuse me, three and a half kilometers from the center of Batu Ampar, the location the government official wanted to give us would create serious obstacles for the great majority of our people who could rely only on their two legs for transportation. No taxis. No bajai, nothing, they walk. Some of them would be mothers with young children who might have to carry an infant in one arm while dragging a toddler and an older child with the other hand. And that only after spending a half hour on a water taxi just to get to Batu Ampad from their sawmill where they lived. When the skies were clear, the equatorial sun in Borneo on many days could bake someone alive, someone who dare step outside for just a few minutes, not to mention someone who would have to walk three and a half kilometers to a Sunday service in the proposed site near the Chinese graveyard. Now, during the rainy monsoon season, the situation would worsen considerably. The dirt path could turn into mud characterized by both slipperiness and molasses-like thickness for those who chose to venture outdoors. It was immediately evident to me, as soon as the government official proposed this location, 
that our years of work in Batuwampad might not survive or face a crippling handicap if we chose to accept the land. The government official noticed my hesitation and he moved to press my back to the wall. You must accept this proposal, he said to me with finality. You have no choice. Sir, I'm sorry, I replied weakly. My strength had been steadily drained by the stifling oppressive atmosphere of the whole meeting. And I said, I, I do not want to build our church on that land. The government official was outraged by my stubbornness. If you do not take the land, he snarled, I will report you to the military commander of our state. We had no idea who this high-ranking military commander was. But in Indonesia, you do not mess with the military. The government official handed me a typed agreement. Sign on the bottom line, please. I tried to buy some time for myself by looking at the agreement in my hands. But I could not take the crushing pressure much longer, not just from this high-ranking government official, but the townspeople who had gathered to see the lynching. I could sense the powers of darkness in the room screeching for our blood. Crucify them, crucify them, crucify them. An antichrist spirit had pervaded throughout the room and every ounce of fairness and compassion for us had evaporated. People with whom we had normally exchanged cordial greetings when crossing paths outside were transformed into snarling beasts, spewing forth venom and hate as the meeting advanced to its conclusion. In Brother Abak's house, where some of the believers had gathered to pray during the meeting, a vision was seen. In the vision, appeared a powerful spirit in the form of an Indonesian man wearing a white skull cap, the kind worn by men who have earned religious merit by making a pilgrimage to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. This spirit in the vision was seen attacking us viciously. Finally, I surrendered to the government officials' wishes. Yet I still I could not get myself to sign the agreement, and so I asked Brother Abak to sign it instead. Abak did so. As we arose from our seats to leave the scene of utter defeat, a chorus of jeers erupted from the townspeople all around the room. On my way to the exit door, a man who had attended the meeting was about to strike me, but a companion stopped him. As we stepped outside, we were swallowed up by a crowd that had gathered outside the restaurant to watch the spectacle through the windows. The crowd pelted us with taunts, mockery, and scornful shouts as we left in apparent shame and defeat. The good news was borne that by the wind to every corner of Batuwampada that evening. The infidel followers of Jesus Christ had been defeated. They were as good as dead. Our brethren, later hearing the outcome, were stunned. They had been fasting. They had been crying out to the Lord daily at five o'clock in the morning. They were believing that those who trust in the Lord will not be put to shame. But it seems that the Lord had ordained that on that Friday night, the very anniversary of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ in Batu Ampad should likewise suffer great shame and be crucified in order that we might know the power of his resurrection, which was to come shortly. Around two weeks later, Batu Ampad was surprised by an unannounced visit from an army helicopter, which had swooped down from the city of Pontianak and landed in an open field on the outskirts of town. A lieutenant colonel leading a detail of armed soldiers filed out of the helicopter. They later met with us and local leaders, and they canceled the agreement we had signed before the government official at the town meeting where we had been crucified before the people. It turned out that the military commander with which the state official had been threatening us, that military commander, 
the military commander of the state of West Borneo, was a spirit-filled believer attending an Assemblies of God church. He was the son-of-law of a pastor. When he heard about the injustice that had befallen us in Batuampar, he took immediate action and sent his lieutenant colonel along with soldiers to Batuampar to nullify the agreement. Eventually, we built our new temporary church on the outskirts of town near where the helicopter landed. That is our temporary church building. If you'd like to know the details, uh, just ask for our book, Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, and I'll be happy to send you the file so you can read the details. Let me share with you what I have learned from this. The house church model is more biblical. In Acts, we do not see church buildings. I am convinced of this now. Again, if you would like to have the narration, if you'd like to have the book from which the narration is taken, it's Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. Just email me at Elijah003 to receive the file of the book. So I will see everyone next week. Two more sessions to go in session one. Just two more sessions, then we are done. Session two begins next month, April 16th.